Hello, my name is Daniel Saunders. Recently, I visited the Auschwitz concentration camp as part of the Lessons from Auschwitz project. Upon my return, I wanted to learn more about the Holocaust, particularly, as in my own experience, when the Holocaust is taught in schools. All of the events are condensed into perhaps just one lesson. Therefore, people are remembered more as statistics rather than as individuals. And so to learn more, I visited the Holocaust Centre in Laxton, North Nottinghamshire. Whilst here, I viewed the two major exhibitions on display, and also, I remained to listen to a survivor talk. Simon Winston was the speaker on that day, and I was able to secure an interview with him. What follows now is the interview. Um, my name is Simon Winston. I was born in 1938 in a small town called Radziwilow, which at the time was in Poland. Um, the town of Radziwilow had um, about 20,000 people, of which 7,000 were Jews, which is quite a large proportion of Jews, but we got on fairly well with our neighbours. Um, when I was just one year old, World War II started. Um, Germany invaded Poland, and of course the Jews in Reggio Villa were very frightened, they were very worried, because we'd heard what the Germans were doing to Jews in Poland, in Germany, <coughs> and we feared the worst. But we needn't have worried, because in 1939, as history tells us, it was the Russians who came to our town. Um, they did try to change our way of life, not just ours, but all the people living in Radziwilla. They introduced a very severe form of communism, but they didn't try to kill Jews. In fact, they allowed Jews to continue to pray in our synagogues just like before. And this continued for two years. And then in 1941, again, history will tell you that Germany invaded Russia. Uh, the Russians in our town were not prepared for this, so they left and very quickly the Germans entered our town and they made it quite obvious that they didn't like Jews because the first thing they did, they ordered the local authorities to give them the names of a hundred dangerous Jews, whatever that may mean. Those Jews who might get in the way of them doing what they intended to do, that was to kill the Jews. So the authorities gave them the names of a hundred Jews, two of them were prominent rabbis, the Germans took those hundred Jews away and they killed them, they shot them dead. Uh, right in front of everybody, they weren't concerned, that put the fear of death into everybody, not just the Jews, but particularly the Jews. They introduced new laws, especially for the Jews. Laws like Jews were not allowed to leave town. Jews could not walk on the pavement, they had to walk on the street. Jews could not have a radio so they couldn't hear what was going on outside. Jews could not go to certain buildings in town like libraries and um, bathhouses and, and certain shops and Jews had all their shops confiscated and Jews eventually had to wear an identification which was a Star of David, a yellow patch on the front and on the back and on the arm. If any Jew disobeyed any of these Jewish laws we weren't just smacked on the back of the hand, we didn't even go to prison. We were shot dead on the spot, so now we were in trouble. And then a few months later the Germans ordered all the Jews, all 7,000 of us, into the market square. When we got there we were told to sit on the floor and suddenly a group of about 20 Nazi machine gunners popped up and they pointed their machine guns at us and we thought this is it, they're going to kill us. And people were screaming and crying and wailing and praying. This continued for about two to three hours. After two to three hours, a high-ranking officer came in his car. He came out of his car. He waved his arm. The machine gunners put their machine guns away and they left. We were then ordered, that's the Jews were then ordered to go back to our houses. When we got back to our houses, we found that they were empty. The Germans had stolen all our belongings, everything, our valuables, but also furniture, tables, chairs, and cookers. And now we didn't even have anything to cook our meagre ration of food that we might have purloined from somewhere. But we needn't have worried, because a few months later, the nice, kind Germans 
They built a new home for us, a ghetto, a prison. The ghetto was in a slummy part of town where a lot of Jews lived already anyway, but all other Jews had to pick up their bits and pieces and go trudging along to this new area called the ghetto. When we got there, we found that the whole area was surrounded by newly constructed walls and barbed wire, lots of barbed wire. The ghetto was also divided into two halves. There was a road going through the middle of it. Ghetto 1, that was for the useful Jews. About a thousand people went into Ghetto 1. They were the, the young, the healthy and the strong. Uh, and thank goodness that's where my parents went because people in Ghetto 1, they were being sent out to work. Anything from 8 to 12 hours a day, 7 days a week. Slave labour. But at least when they came back, they were rewarded with food. Enough food for my father to go into Ghetto 2 and give some of his food to his parents, my grandparents. People in Ghetto 2 were not getting any food. They were deliberately being starved to death. And one of my father's jobs was to go into Ghetto 2 with a cart and pick up dead bodies and take them to a nearby field and bury them there. And when there were only 2,000 Jews left in Ghetto 2, and the Germans must have thought, well, they're not dying fast enough, they gave them a push. They ordered all the Jews out of Ghetto 2, 2,000 of them, into Waldman's Yard, as my father names it. And that was a works yard next to the Grand Synagogue. Um, when they got there, the men were separated from the women. About 1,000 men were then force marched five miles into a nearby forest. And when they got to their destination, they found that there were two huge pits already dug. The pits were covered in lime. The men were ordered to take off their clothes and put them on a nice neat pile and go and stand around the first pit, which they did. They couldn't argue. They were skeletal. They were like zombies. And they were shot dead and their bodies fell into the pit. A group of Ukrainian soldiers then buried them. Those same Ukrainian soldiers were then ordered back to Waldman's yard to fetch the women. And just like the men, the women were ordered to march five miles into this clearing in the forest. And when they got to their destination, they also had to take off their clothes, put them on a nice neat pile and go and stand around the second pit. And they too were shot dead and the bodies covered over very quickly. So on that day, 2,000 innocent Jews were brutally murdered by the Nazis simply because they were Jews. After this horrendous massacre where 2,000 Jews were murdered by the Nazis, there were only 500 Jews left in Ghetto 1 because a lot of Jews were being sent out on work duties from Ghetto 1 and they never came back. Um, also, we'd heard that all the other towns and cities were now becoming Judenrein, Jew-free. They'd killed all the Jews living there. And we were afraid that Radzivilla was going to be Judenrein, made Judenrein. In other words, that we would get killed. And that's when people started to make plans to escape. It wasn't going to be easy, because if you did escape, where were you going to hide? What were you going to do for food? And you needed papers. Well, to that end, my father, who was a very pragmatic person, had made plans even before the ghetto was built. What he did, he sold most of his valuables and used the money to purchase small bars of gold, eight ounces each, today worth about £10,000. And he would hide these gold bars in clothing and false bottoms on shoes and false bottoms on brushes. And that was the currency for our survival and it worked because I'm here to tell you the story. And the very first gold bar that my father would have probably used would have been one to bribe a Nazi guard on the outside, a German Nazi guard on the outside, to allow us to escape. And he did, and that was a miracle because, think about it, this Nazi, German Nazi guard, he must have realized if we've got one gold bar, we've got more, and searched us and found all the other gold bars and still killed us or handed us into the Germans, but he didn't. He took his one gold bar and he allowed us to escape. Then we had to find our first hiding place. And to that end, um, it wasn't straightforward. First of all, 
we had a bolt hole. We had a house about half a mile away to temporarily hide in until my father could go out and find his other hiding places. He'd made arrangements before the ghetto was built with some Polish farmers and he decided or they decided that the best place to hide would be a hole in the ground near a pigsty, the least likely place where the Germans would want to look for Jews. Um, but he didn't know where these places were, whether they were ready or not. He told me afterwards that in actual fact there were six Polish farmers who were prepared to hide us and in the end we only needed three of those hiding places. Um, so we went to this uh, bolt hole of a house but when we got to the house the woman came out and she said please don't ask us to hide you because the Germans have been there, threatened us, they've warned us if they find any Jews we'll kill the whole family. And then she gave us some good advice. She said you want to go to Brody which was a small town near Radzivilov. She said because they've killed all the Jews in Brody, there's no Jews living there, no reason why the Germans should be looking for Jews there. But she said you'll have to cross the river, there was a river separating Brody and Radzivilov. Um, don't cross the bridge because the bridge is being manned by some Ukrainian Nazis. So we went downstream and we, as we walked downstream I remember, this is the first time I actually remember something because I remember my father did a right turn and he walked straight into the river and he started walking across the river until the water got up to his shoulders and by that time he was already halfway across the river, so it didn't drown him. And he was able to come back for each one of us, me, my brother and my mother, and carry us to the other side of the river. And now we were free, but soaking wet. We were w walking along and suddenly we came across um, a house that we didn't know existed, a solitary house. And a woman came out of this house and she saw us, she must have immediately recognised that we were escaped Jews from the ghetto, would have probably been rewarded for handing us in, but she didn't. She actually invited us into her house, allowed us to dry ourselves, allowed us to stay overnight. We were so grateful to that family. But in the morning, just like the other woman, she said, please, please don't ask to stay any longer because the Germans have been, they've threatened us, they've warned us to find any Jews, we'll kill the whole family. So now we were on the run. Um, and before we could go to our first hiding place, my father had to check that it was ready. So he would hide each one of us in temporary hiding places and then come and fetch us. And on one occasion, I remember he put me in a field full of tall corn and he told me to crouch down and wait for him. Well, I did that. I didn't think anyone could see me. And I waited about 20 minutes. And after 20 minutes, instead of my father coming to pick me up, a group of Ukrainian soldiers found me there. I was frightened, I was really frightened. And I remember one of the soldiers saying to me, what's your name? I gave him a name, not my real name. And they said, um, where do you live? I gave him a false address. And then they said, what are you doing? I said, I'm playing hide and seek. I'm waiting for my friends to find me. And they believed me and they left. And that was the third miracle. And the real miracle of that was that I was able to speak to them in Ukrainian because I was brought up to speak Polish. And what my father, who was born in Russia, and he could speak Russian, Ukrainian and Polish, he taught each one of us little phrases in Ukrainian just in case we were ever caught. And then uh, we were able to talk our way out and it worked. Um, when we got to our first hiding place, it wasn't much fun. It was even worse than living in the ghetto because there was less space, less room and less food. Less food because um, the Germans used to regularly come and raid Polish farms and steal the farmers' food. So the farmer didn't even have enough for himself, let alone feed another family. And also we couldn't come out in the daytime because the farmer never knew when the Germans might call to raid the farm. So we could only come out first in the morning and then at dusk and that was just to slop out, get some fresh water, any food that the farmer might have had for us and a bit of fresh air. And that was just to roam around in the fields, try to find some root vegetables that might have still been on the ground. And on one occasion we were nearly found out because the farmer after dusk told us that the Russians were here, sorry the Germans were here 
and uh, we had to go quickly back to the bunker. Um, so we were nearly caught out on that occasion. Uh, as I said, we actually hid in three different hiding places and probably the best hiding place of all was the third one, the last one, because it was in a barn and we hid in the cellar underneath the barn. And because it was a barn, we could come out in the daytime because the barn had windows. And also, the cellar of the barn was much bigger than the hiding places in the, the bunkers. So we had more room and my father was able to invite some of his friends and his relatives to join us, those who were looking for hiding places. And in the end, we had eight to ten people staying in that last hiding place, the cellar. And one of the people who came to our hiding place was my mother's brother's wife. She was on the run with her husband, but her husband sadly was caught by the Germans and killed. Um, and she was on the lookout for a hiding place. And when she found that my father had a hiding place for her, she was overjoyed and she came to join us. But when she came to join us, she uh, was pregnant. And after about three months, she gave birth. And the baby started to scream and cry as babies usually do. And the farmer heard this and he was very frightened. He told us to get out. He was worried about his own family. And we had to make a terrible, terrible decision. It was that baby, that child, or 20 other people and that child. Sadly, I have to report that that child was suffocated. I only heard about it really 10 or so years ago when someone, a descendant, wrote a book about it. And the saddest part of that story is if that child would have been born just three months later, it would have survived. Because three months later, the farmer opened the trap door, I remember this, um, and the sun was shining, and he uttered three words in Polish, which I didn't understand. He said, you are free. I didn't know what that meant. I thought I was going to live like this for the rest of my life or get killed. And my father did ask him, what's happened? He said, the Germans have left, the Russians are back. And sure enough, that was the case. The farmer even said, you can go back home now. Well, my father did try to go back to our house, which by now was about 20 miles away. But he came back and he told us, we can't go back to our house because it's owned now by a Ukrainian family and no way are they going to let us have our house back. So we became refugees. Um, we weren't the only ones, about half a million Jews who survived the Holocaust, survived the war, also were homeless, had nowhere to go, nowhere to live. But not only half a million Jews, but four and a half million non-Jews became dispossessed, displaced, were knocked about from pillar to post, had nowhere to live. And that's when the United Nations, who had just been created, came into uh, the picture because they realised that they'd got a problem. And they started to build what they called DP camps, displaced persons camps. And I remember the first camp that we lived in. We lived in a tent um, in a huge field with about 100 more tents. But at least it was um, freedom um, and it was home. And we gradually progressed to huts and then apartments, but still we didn't have anywhere permanent to live in. Until 1947, when my mother discovered that she had a brother who lived in England. He came to England in 1939, that's a long story, but when he discovered that his sister was still alive, my mother, he did everything possible to bring us over to England. And successfully so, because I'm here. Uh, it wasn't straightforward, we had to satisfy two conditions. One was that um, we had a home to live in because there was no free housing for asylum seekers in those days. Also that we had, um, uh, that my father had a job because there's no free welfare for asylum seekers and my uncle found him a job uh, in a flour mill and my father used two of his gold bars to buy a 10 year lease on a house in Nottingham. Having satisfied those two conditions, we came to Britain. Um, Obviously, I was overjoyed. Remember, I'd lost my childhood and suddenly I was playing with kids of my own age 
Um, I was learning new games like cricket, playing old games like football, cycling, going cycling and train spotting and going to school. I loved school. I was quite good at school. I actually finished up going to a grammar school. Should have gone to university, but I failed my A-levels. Uh, I could have waited three months and sat them again. But at the time, there was a thing called national service. Everyone over the age of 18 in Britain had to do two years in the army. I thought, well, I've got to do that. I'll get that over with. So I signed up in the army. I spent two years in the Royal Engineers, two fantastic years, my coming of age. And then when I left the army, I trained as a civil engineer. I actually worked as a civil engineer surveyor for five years. Then I met a friend who was a school teacher and he uh, persuaded me to become a teacher too. So I trained as a teacher for three and a half years, became a teacher and then taught for many, many years until about six years ago. But all the time when I was in Britain, when I was in primary school, when I was in secondary school, when I was in grammar school, when I was in the army, when I was at college, when I was an, a civil engineer, when I was a teacher, I never told anyone my story like I've just told you now, until about 14, 15 years ago. Um, 15 years ago, someone told me about Beth Shalom, the Holocaust Memorial Centre, this place. So I came to have a look, I was very impressed. And I came back the following week, clutching my father's manuscript because my father, over the years of the ghetto and even before the ghetto and certainly in hiding, he was writing a diary of events that happened and he finished up with a 41 page manuscript. I showed it to Stephen Smith who created this wonderful place, he and his family, the Smith family. Um, he was very impressed, uh, asked me to write a book. I finished up writing 10 pages in a much larger book. But I offered to come and help out as much as possible here. And I, eventually I finished up by telling my story as I've told you now. So you mentioned about speaking to other people, but did you speak much to your family about your experiences? Immediately after the war, yes, my father was still telling me about what happened to us, particularly about things that I wouldn't remember because I was still a boy in the ghetto, still a baby a child. Uh, because he would always say, you'll have to tell other people this happened. They won't believe you otherwise. You, there's got to be a witness to this. Uh, in the end, even when he was living in Israel, he, when I'd visit him, he'd start telling me stories about what happened. In the end, I got fed up of uh, listening to him because um, it was boring. I wanted to get on with my life. I wish now I'd listened more to what he had to tell me. Um, but yes, that was the situation. In the end, I stopped... Uh, uh, bothering to listen to him. And uh, have you ever revisited Rad Zivinov since settling back in England? No, sadly I haven't. Um, for a long time no Jew was allowed to go back there um, and even now there are no Jews living in Rad Um For some reason or other they um, barred us from going there until one day they, um, first of all, um, allowed us to put a plaque on the main building which was our grand synagogue to say this is the, this was the synagogue for Jews when they lived in Rajivilov and then they also later allowed us to build a memorial garden five miles away in the very area where 2,000 Jews were slaughtered so we built a memorial garden there and people from Israel and America descendants and survivors have actually visited that place I tried to go with them, but I wanted to go from England and I had great difficulty trying to get a visa. Uh, I was stopped at various stages. I won't go into detail about it, but I was deliberately being stopped from going there. Now I've got another problem. It's much easier now, I think, to go there. But I've got a problem of trying to get a translator and also I've got health problems too. Have you ever visited one of the Nazi death camps such as Auschwitz or Treblinka? And if so, what was it like? Uh, yes, I visited Auschwitz twice and I also visited um, Belgiac and Maidenek <clears throat> a couple of years ago. We went on a, um, a special visit with 20, other t 20 teachers 
um, and it was very profound. The, the first time I visited Auschwitz, which is probably the most profound place in the world, the most horrible place in the world, um, I went with my cousin in Poland, who uh, was actually the daughter of the woman that I told you who came to, uh, who lost her child. Um, and um, we went with a friend of hers, and when we um, were in Auschwitz I, because Auschwitz is a large place, it's actually three different camps, she was so sickened by it all, she wouldn't go any further. But I vowed that I would see the whole of Auschwitz, so two years ago I actually saw the whole of Auschwitz and everything that happened there. And I was uh, very fortunate because I went along with another survivor who comes to speak here quite regularly, Kitty Hart Moxon, who actually stay, had um, lived and stayed in Auschwitz for a year and a half, and she had some horrendous stories to tell. What was it like adapting to life in England after the war? Well, I was overjoyed when we came to England because suddenly, remember I'd lost my childhood and suddenly I was playing with kids of my own age. It was wonderful and I was going to school. Um, and I've already mentioned that, but um, also I was fortunate, or we were fortunate, that there was a ready-made Jewish community here, so I was able to integrate uh, both with the Jewish part of me, but also with um, the British part, that I was quickly able to learn the language and um, learn some of the ways and uh, life of life here, and I've become uh, a, a naturalised uh, Britain. In fact, that's exactly what happened to us. We became naturalised and suddenly we had a passport. Instead of saying stateless, the passport said British. I was overjoyed with that. So, uh, how did the Jewish community in England, I mean, what did they talk about the Holocaust? I mean, what were they like? Well, that's a moot point. It's a sore point too, because um, um, at the end, in the end, I didn't talk about it either because I noticed that my father, who was a religious man and he went to the synagogue regularly. Um, he only had about half a dozen, if that, friends who were at all interested in listening to him telling what happened to us in the Holocaust in, in Rajivilov and what, what the Nazis did. It was almost as though they were in denial. So we learned and I learned very quickly that you don't talk about it, you just get on with your life and then people are more friendly towards you. So in that sense, um, uh, we too were in denial. Uh, now I believe I'm right in thinking that you commissioned a sculpture here. Uh, could you tell us a bit more about that? Yes, uh, the sculpture was actually sculpted by a dear friend of mine, uh, Stanley Bullard, who uh, 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 he was, on this particular occasion we were um, holidaying in Yosemite Park in California. And it was whilst there that I remember Stanley mooting the idea um, to um, construct a sculpture in Beth Shalom um, to commemorate my uh, hiding. Um, now he was a wood sculptor, but he agreed. I, I agreed to it, of course, and uh, um, he um, decided he wanted to do it in stone. The only stone piece of work that he ever did, as far as I know, um, and it took him the uh, best part of a year to do it. Um, uh, so that was the time. That was. I'll tell you when it was, it was in uh, right in the time of 9-11 because we were in America at the time when 9-11 happened um, and uh, that was um, about a year later it was all ready and uh, um, unveiled. Uh, well we're running out of time so I'll probably get straight onto this question then. Um, have you suffered prejudice since moving to this country? Um, since moving to this country, well, the, the very first time we came to, to this country, uh, there was prejudice, um, instant prejudice. I, I felt it in school, uh, in primary school and secondary school, because, um, um, you see, there were no minority groups here of note. There, there were hardly any black people and hardly any Asian people. Um, but there was a very large minority group of Jews. There were about half a million or so Jews in Britain. We'd been here for centuries. And because there were no racist laws in those days, people were allowed to poke fun and make racist remarks about Jews um, that you wouldn't be allowed to today. And I felt it very bitterly, all the uh, jibes and all the uh, 
anti-Semitic Jewish jokes, the racist jokes. Um, and very often I'd had fights in school and in the army. Um, and in the end I decided, well, it's not worth it. And uh, I didn't talk about it. Um, and then uh, some people did, some of my best friends didn't even know that I was Jewish. Um, and this persisted right through to my army days when again, I was picked on for being Jewish and I had to fight my way out I, in order to survive and uh, gain um, some kind of respect. I had to fight someone um, because he called me all sorts of things and he was very anti-Semitic towards me. A harrowing story. Indeed, it's evident that prejudice has far-reaching and often dangerous consequences. So I believe it's essential to learn lessons from the Holocaust. Unfortunately, since the Holocaust itself, few of these lessons have been learned. And so after the interview, I asked Simon if he had a message to part to the audience of this film. This is what he said. People are different. They may be different because of their religion. They may be different because of their race. Um, they may be different simply because of the color of their skin. They may be different because of their beliefs or their lifestyles. Don't pick on people simply because they're different, because that leads to discrimination, prejudice, and later to abuse, and eventually it could lead to genocide. Don't pick on people because they're different. <laughs>